Rush Perkins. So she's a suffragette who worked hard in the Ohio area to help pass the 19th Amendment. When the 19th Amendment was passed, her and her friend Charlotte decided to hop on a train out to California because they wanted to spend some time out in the wild, out in the desert, out in the no man's land, to get away from all that they had been doing, all the protesting and rallying and um, activism that they had been part of. And so they went out to the desert, and on their train ride from Ohio to California, they looked at the books to try to figure out, you know, reading all the travel logs, where should we go? And their hearts settled on Death Valley. And so they started to talk to everybody about Death Valley and traveling through it. And everywhere they turned, they said, two women can't go into Death Valley alone. You don't want to go into Death Valley. You do not want to travel there. Everywhere they turned, people kept saying no to them. So they got to... Um, They got to Southern California, and they got to the San Diego area, well, into California, and they were going to the Southern California Automobile Association, right? Because everybody goes to AAA if they want information on where to travel, right? So, everybody said to them, so she wrote a memoir about her trip into the Valley. It seemed to be unheard of for two women to attempt such a thing. The distances between the towns where we could get accommodations were too great, and the roads were apt to have long stretches of sand where we would get stuck. Our friends drew a dismal picture of us sitting out in the sagebrush beside a disabled car and slowly starving to death. So they finally reached Sarasota Springs, which is near the tip of Death Valley in California. And they were greeted there with enthusiasm for them to go on this trip. And they found a guy who got them on the train that they went into Nevada, so they had to go back all the way through to come back into Death Valley, where they hired more like a prospector, right? Now this is in this is in a time when we do have cars, right? But they end up with a buggy and horses or, you know, to take them through the Death Valley. The horses were named Bill and Molly. <laughs> so they found somebody who will guide them. And the adventure included surviving heat and the dearth of water, sandstorms, snow, and ice, icy mountains. And it instilled in Perkins and Jordan a sense of awe. In her memoir, she describes their harrowing adventures, never downplaying the real and present dangers of the landscape. Her words never strayed too far from admiring the beauty, and describes the desert in its ever changing palette of color. She wrote, We called it Need a Vacation not knowing that every desire to withdraw from the crowd is a personal assertion and a protest against struggle and worry, the bluff and banality, the everlasting tail chasing which goes on inside the walls of the stately estate house and the two-room suite with that. Our real craving was not for a play hour, but for the wild and lonely place and a different kind of freedom from that about which we had been preaching. Edna and Charlotte encountered an area in our country that has one of the highest peaks and one of the lowest dust in the nation. You go from these massive sand dunes to low mountains to incredible um, sand formations, rock formations that have been dug out and created over time. But it's still a place that people warn you about. 
So if you read the instructions before you go into the national park, they tell you to make sure you have four liters of water because they have a lot of visitors out of the country who don't use our system. Four liters of water and a spare tire on your car that works because you could end up in a spot where you will not encounter anybody for hours. So if you get wrecked or blow a tire, you don't want to be out there without your water and without an ability to change your tire and get out of there. Still today, they talk about the harshness of that landscape. In our biblical story, the Israelites are talking about the harshness of the landscape. Okay? So, when we lost Moses last week, Moses had just talked to the Israelites. Well, no, sorry. He had just talked to God. He had just talked to God, and God talked to him and told him he was going to free the Israelites. So in between that passage and today, Moses freed the Israelites from Egypt. He did whatever it took to get them their freedom. He made promises. He threatened. He had God perform acts to get it so that the Israelites could be free from slavery. And so they set out away from Egypt to get away from Pharaoh and enslavement. And as they begin, now, they're not very far into their journey, okay? They have just fled Egypt with everything they could carry, everything that they could load into whatever they had to transport them. And as they're on their way, to leave Egypt means to enter the desert. And you heard what their first words were, right? Why are you bringing in this, into this place of death? We were better off back in Egypt where we had meals and food and work. And now you're bringing us into this desert environment. And look behind us. The Egyptian army is on its way to recapture them and bring them back into slavery. And so the Israelites are focused on death, on, on that barrenness of the land, on the sense that they are not going to make it and survive because there's an army literally right behind them. And then I don't know if you noticed, but Moses and God have a disagreement in this passage. Moses tells them to stand still, and God will rescue them to this. And God says to them, you need to get moving. But what does it mean to move? Because in front of them is also what looks to be death. Because they're at water. They have to somehow get across that water or be run down by the chariots behind them. And you've all seen Moses, right? Charleston has been in the water's part and they walk right through. The rabbis tell the story a little different. The rabbis tell the story that it took effort to get them to move that they walked into the water, and they kept walking into the water, and the water kept getting higher because it's a sea, right? And they kept walking and walking and walking until the water, it got high, ready to drown them. And that point, that point of death, that point of fear, that point at which it seems like there is no hope, that point at which they give up and give everything to God, that is the moment that the waters recede and they can go through. That was a story Emily Heath shared. She shared how she learned about the Red Sea party differently than all we had always been taught about our visions of Charleston Heston and the stick and the parting of the seas. 
But for the rabbis, when they teach it, it's more of a struggle. It's more of a challenge to get through the sea. I think God, in that moment, is inviting us not to passively accept, not to expect the world to be a miracle that is going to come down and rescue us, but wants you to take part in your own rescue, to choose your own rescue, to choose life in the face of death, to choose to move forward even into the danger. When you go to Death Valley, most times you're going to see barren landscape like that. Most times it is going to look and feel as if it is a hard and dangerous place. Because you know it is the hottest place in the United States. Like they have had temperatures up to 134 degrees there. Um, I think recently it's been even higher than that. But the average temperature can run around 112. And they get two inches of water. So that being stuck, when that two inches of rain falls, the entire valley becomes filled with flowers. The entire valley, for this moment in time, blooms in a way that you never imagined it could bloom. Edna wrote about it. We know that the valley was sterile and dead, yet we saw it covered with a mantle of such strange beauty that we felt it was the noblest thing we had ever imagined, to stand still in the companionship of greatness. Anyway, my point was <laughs> that in that moment when those flowers bloom, you will see that whole array that looks dead come back to life. And what, what people speak about in Death Valley is that there's a sense that it is full of lifelessness because what you see looks so barren. But everywhere you turn within Death Valley, you can encounter life. They have in their little pool a type of fish that is only found in Death Valley because there's no way to get out of the desert from their pond to any other place. But they also have life, and there have been human life in this valley for all time. That people have settled there, even though it can be one of the harshest landscapes around. It also has great beauty and promise. In that valley, you'll find road runners yeah, like the Wiley Coyote, you know, you, there is a picture in there of her summers. You will find birds that are only known to that area. There are botanists who come to Death Valley to study the life that grows there because it only grows there. That when we're choosing to move, when we're choosing to get moving, God is asking us to move from that sense of death into the presence of life. To see that a barren landscape isn't as barren when you start looking at it and seeing the lizards and the coyotes and the road runners and the birds. That in Death Valley there is also life. And God's asking us to choose and move and get closer to that life to take that step forward. In our scripture today, Moses is encouraging the people, reminding them that what they had in the past, that enslavement, that death, that culture that kept them down, is not the promise that God has for them in the future. God promises them life. God promises them if they get moving, 